All right, welcome back to another edition of We Rise Fighting Labor podcast. We bring you today's labor news, history, and analysis from the U.S. and around the world. This is a podcast you listen to with your fellow workers organizing on the shop floor. This is a podcast you listen to before walking into your union meeting. As always, I am here with my co-host, Jerry Scapatulo. Hello, everyone. And Brian Pfeiffer. Good evening, fellow workers. And today we are going to bring you the news as always, just after this music. Occupy, we been occupied, we gotta occupy, we are the movement. Occupy them, occupy them, occupy them, occupy them, occupy them. Occupy their operation, occupy them, disseminate profitization, occupy them, eliminate their intuition, occupy them, dismantle their organization, occupy them, shut it down, burn it down, occupy them, shut it down, burn it all down, occupy don't them. trust the religion built on the slavery. All right. In labor news this week, NPR reports Medicaid and Medicare hotline workers go on strike over pay and working conditions. Uh, Workers who handle calls at Medicare and Affordable Care Act health plans walked off the job in Louisiana, Mississippi, Kentucky, and Virginia, demanding better pay and a less stressful workload. Call centers who organized with support from the Communication Workers of America delivered the demands to company leadership five days before the walkout. Employers at Maximus do not belong to a union, even though they have been organizing for many months. The CWA, Communications of Workers of America, said that more than 400 workers were on straight at all four call centers. An update on the railway workers' strike. Uh, You know, we were talking about this before jumping on the air. Uh, This is always very exciting. And, you know, the media continues to report on this. Fortune magazine reports, we are headed for a rail strike by Thanksgiving that could cripple U.S. supply chains and push the economy, quote, unquote, over the edge. Over the edge. Man, this is this is become this is becoming some serious sky is falling shit. And again, over what? Six days. Six days. <laughs> the sky is falling, and here we go. Uh, this is what Fortune magazine is reporting. <clears throat> if it does come to a strike, it could have big implications on the U.S. economy. The averted September strike could cost the econo- the, the country as much as two billion dollars a day in supply chain disruptions that would aggravate soaring inflation, according to a study by the Association of American Railroads. And experts tell Fortune a strike now will have similar, if not greater, impact given the upcoming holiday season. Man, you need experts for that. A strike just ahead of Thanksgiving and at the beginning of the busiest shipping season for retailers could derail the quote-unquote main artery of the U.S. economy. Uh, Darius Irani, chief economist at Towson University's Region, Regional Economic Studies Institute and railroad economics expert, told Fortune, it could even provide kindling to the smoldering fire of the U.S. recession many economists predicts, predict is on its way. And finally, in the commentary from Fortune magazine, uh, we're already facing a supply chain crisis. And now with this on top of it, it could just be a fast accelerant towards a recession, Irani said. This would be one of those things that pushed the economy towards an inflationary recession. So all that, all that, and all the workers are asking for is sick days. And CNN also has another report um, where they talk about how the labor secretary says Congress needs to block rail strikes with new deals. We were talking about this before before jumping on the call. Here's what CNN reports. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh says he hoped negotiators between railroads and some rail unions can reach new labor deals and avert a possible strike. But he said without a deal, he expects Congress will step in and impose contracts on the 
unhappy, th th that's their wording, on the unhappy rank and file union members. Now, this is what we were talking about before we jumped on, right, comrades? Like, where is laissez faire now? You know, as soon as uh, the railway, railway workers or any workers, any organized workers, show that they can flex some strength, uh, corporations always immediately turn to political representatives, to um, governmental bodies, to intervene. They call on the police to crack the strike, the National Guard, anytime anything like this, the, the judges to call an injunction, anytime they're threatened, it's no longer laissez-faire, it's no longer let the market be. All of a sudden they want government inter intervention. <clears throat> and so that's the report from the railway workers and the Medicare uh, workers. And finally, Common Dreams reports that 55,000 Ontario education workers are on strike despite some new draconian anti-labor law. Now, I didn't have time to get into this one so deep, um, but I'll just read one excerpt from it. Uh, defying new legislation fast-tracked by right-wing Ontario Premier Doug Ford outlying strikes, more than 55,000 education workers in the Canadian province hit the picket lines Friday, vowing to stay in the streets for, quote, as long as it takes, unquote, to secure a contract they feel is fair. Now, I just wanted to include that one because that's just how you do it. That's it. Well, thanks, Rick. Just real quick, back to the uh, railroad workers for a minute. In solidarity with the education workers, exactly. Uh, governments, one of our great leaders, a lot of great leaders over the years, including Dr. King, said, well, you know, there's not an injunction that he didn't defy. And if it's uh, immoral, we're going to defy a law. And this is definitely an immoral law, and it deserves defiance. And uh, we just want to let our uh, listeners know that uh, the Railroad Workers United is a coalition of a wide range of unions and community organizations. And they had a very important call on November 1st. So there, a lot of information is on their Railroad Workers United Facebook page, and especially their website. And you can check that out. And there's YouTube videos up there as well, and it's fast-paced developments, uh, daily updates uh, for what's going on with the railroad workers' uh, struggle. So thanks, Rick. Absolutely. You know, we're keeping the news a little short this week because it's been a pretty busy week for all of us. And, of course, because we uh, brought you that special report, that special interview on Thursday. So keeping it short and sweet this week. Um, but still very excited about what we're about to talk about right now. Uh, this week's episode is dedicated to the theme of how strikes are won. And so that's what we're going to be talking about in just a little bit after we check out this jam. All right, everyone, welcome back. And as I said before, this week we are going to focus on the topic of how strikes are won. Now, this is a huge topic. Uh, it could be, you know, you could take several different approaches to it. Uh, my personal approach was to go back through a little bit of history and see what strikes have taught me, taught us, the working class, some lessons, uh, and share some of those lessons from those strikes. Um, so I'm going to be sharing some lessons from strikes as well as some research methods so that we can find information to pull off stronger, more militant strikes. And then I'm going to hand it over to Brian, who's going to talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of organizing and the prep work and the messaging and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and move forward on this. How strikes are won. <clears throat> now, the first thing that I'd like to chime in on 
uh, with this is that I'd like to say that strikes are instructive. Uh, they're part, they're at the forefront of the working class struggle. The strikes are when the gloves come off and the fight is completely on, right? Uh, and strikes can serve to point out the contradictions of cop, of capitalism and the capitalist as an o as an owning class. And what I mean by that is that strikes can help shatter the illusions of private ownership. Uh, it brings to question what ownership is. In other words, ownership of a company. So for instance, Elon Musk's ownership of Tesla, Henry Ford's ownership of Ford, um, uh, Jeff Bezos ownership of um, Amazon or the shareholder ownership of Amazon. You know, it brings forward these questions, like what exactly is ownership and how come the owners of these businesses walk away with the profits created by the working class? Like what, 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 what makes that happen? What social relation makes that happen? And to answer the, the ownership question, the answer that makes most sense to me is that ownership is a certificate. It comes down to a certificate. Someone holding the certificate that says they own this corporation or they own the shares in this corporation and they are therefore entitled to the benefits that come out of the corporation, meaning profits. And those profits are created through the labor of the workers. So strikes bring, bring to question these sorts of things. And, you know, even the profits themselves, for instance, like how can you call anything profitable if your workforce isn't receiving a living wage, if your workforce isn't receiving health care, vacation, sick days? How can you call any kind of profit if your workforce isn't receiving those sorts of things? So in the heat of the moment, in the flash of class struggle, you know, these are the questions that strikes can bring up. And one strike, if successful, can inspire an entire strike wave. Uh, we saw that with the teachers union just a few years back. Um, and of course, on the flip side of that, uh, a, a strike, if crushed, can demoralize other workers thinking of going on strike. However, <clears throat> a strike wave under the right conditions can lead to something bigger. For instance, a labor upsurge, a general strike, a political strike, a mass mobilization or convergence, the seizure of political power. And we need to be ready for all of this, you know? And as a Marxist, the way I see unions is that they're the institutions, the schools for what a better society could look like. They should be and can be in the microcosms of what a larger democratic society could look like. So what our unions look like and how they act in moments of strikes is really important uh, and can have consequences for future struggles or future movements. So these questions are really important. Uh, so for tonight, I chose to first highlight some general lessons that I've learned from labor history that, I, that have contributed to successful strikes. Uh, and then I'd like to get into how to research information for successful strikes. So here we go. Uh, throughout the years, I've learned that workers can accomplish more with a 15-day strike than they can from 15 years of begging the Democratic Party for some kind of legislative reform. Uh, the 1997 UPS strike taught me this one. Uh, unions should therefore stop contributing their money to the Democratic Party and focus on building the strike fund instead. Also, as part of a successful strike, <clears throat> and we covered this actually, uh, or Brother Clarence Thomas covered this a little bit uh, when he was on the air with us. Uh, I believe that as part of a successful strike, uh, no union officer, be it an elected official or staff, should make a penny more than any union member. Uh, I believe this is the princip a principle that the labor movement needs to uphold in every single union, um, because first off, there's no reason for this. Um, <clears throat> union officials with inflated salaries create a situation where they're distant from the membership. They're removed from it. Uh, if, for instance, the union president is making $150,000 a year and negotiating the contract of workers making 15 bucks an hour, that union president's going to have more in common with the bosses than with the union's membership. And if that's the case, they'll be quicker to sell out the membership and sign a shitty or concessionary contract. Um, you know, I got to say, I learned that one from personal real life experience. That was the experience that I saw at UFCW Local 7 when I worked there as a union representative. Uh, the UPS strike taught me a few other things. 
Uh, one, the membership needs to be surveyed prior to the contract negotiations and strikes. That way you know exactly where your membership is at and what they're re ready to roll up their sleeves and fight for. Brian, I know you were going to talk about this one as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Rick, uh, this is a great section. I think uh, this is right to the heart of uh, where we're going here with preparing properly for a strike. We're going up not just against a single employer. We're going against every worker really needs to uh, understand that when you go out against a single employer, that single employer has the courts, the cops, the judges, the might of the entire capitalist state behind it. So proper preparation is absolutely essential. Uh, as you're going to lay out here, uh, you know, uh, surveys, making sure we do things uh, way in advance and having a proper strike preparation is uh, essential to uh, winning the strike and combating demoralization and making sure things move in a steady uh, manner. We can actually win. That's right. Another thing the 1997 UPS strike taught me uh, was that. Exactly. That strike preparation that Brian just mentioned, you know, this stuff has to happen at least a year and a half before the strike deadline. Uh, that means at least any, <clears throat> excuse me, at least a year and a half before the strike deadline, you got to start building that strike fund. You have to start educating the membership about the bosses, about the company, uh, which I'll speak to later, because there's a lot of information that we can get ourselves. Um, the union the, and the union membership has to start forming community alliances so that the community is on our side. We have solidarity and support from, from the community. The union has to get on board with messaging so that anyone from the, from the union can speak to the media. You know, I saw that in the UPS strike and some of the footage from the UPS strike, you know, there was a picket line and there was a reporter just walking up to any random worker. And it seemed like any quote unquote random worker was just comfortable talking to the media. And I think that's critical. You know, that way everyone knows, you know, what they're fighting for, what direction they're going in and, and all that, uh, which in turn requires discussion, uh, democratic discussion, debate, uh, the dialectics at work. <clears throat> so I think another key um, ingredient in pulling off a successful strike is having a democratic union. In other words, a union where the workers, the members are heard. You know, I'm not talking about Robert's Rules of Order here. I'm not talking about the bylaws or the Constitution. I'm talking about the general culture of the union. You know, workers have to be heard. They have to know that their input is being heard and considered and, you know, being debated and discussed by their fellow workers and union members. So those are some of my larger contributions to how strikes are won. Um, Brian and Jerry will have more information. I'm about to get into some more about how to research information towards strike, but Jerry, uh, you got something you want to chime in with. What's, what's going on? What's up? Thank you. I just wanted to like reinforce what you said about, uh, the, the beauty of having any worker on strike, be a spokesperson for the union and the strike. Uh, I won't name the union, but it was about 30 years ago. Uh, I worked on a strike of 700 nurses. I was a staff person. And uh, the International Union uh, brought staff in. Uh, they brought one person in just to sort of massage uh, the local representatives of the press by having, you know, friendly conversations with them in an attempt to uh, mold public opinion, you know, uh, going after the opinion leaders was uh, the corporate uh, uh, maxim that we used on that strike. And while I'm not saying that, you know, may not possibly ever be able to help, uh, it, it, you know, it covers up, you know, the naked uh, class struggle that's involved with the worker on strike who doesn't know where their next meal is coming from, but is willing to, you know, do without something in order to, to strike. So uh, that's, the union staff can often be uh, a, a come between the workers and uh, their union uh, and the, the public. Um, so what you said is well said, uh, but uh, please go on because I think you have some more uh, to share, Rick, about uh, corporate research and how in the hands of the workers uh, it can be a really strong uh, For sure. Tool. For sure. Thank you. And that's actually going to be the bulk of my contribution for tonight. 
um, because this is one thing um, that I've studied in depth. Um, so the larger contribution for me tonight is how strike on um, this how strikes are one podcast will be how to research information to carry out a strike or how to put how to research information um, <clears throat> to you know be able to carry out a better fight during a strike. So um, let me give a little background about myself and in this part I'm also going to talk about Brian and Jerry actually uh, because the three of us, if you haven't caught this already on a previous podcast, what we have in common is that the three of us went to the Uni University of Massachusetts Labor Center, uh, which is a pro-union, pro-worker graduate program uh, in Amherst, Massachusetts. <clears throat> and part of what the program fo focuses on is strategic corporate research, uh, meaning uh, it taught us to analyze corporate documents. It taught us to gov uh, an analyze government documents so as to get the information workers need to fight a stronger fight and get bigger gains. Um, so this research taught us, for instance, to find the jugular or the weak spots or the contradictions that workers and unions could use against the corporation. So, you know, weak, weak spots in production that, that can be exploited, um, weak spots in the workplace that can be exploited um, to put pressure on a company to recognize uh, the workers or the union's demands. <clears throat> so that's kind of what this program focused on. And within that, um, I'll just share a little personal stuff about myself. Within that uh, style of research, there's a lot of financial analysis, or there can be uh, financial analysis. And that's actually what intimidated me the most back in the day when we first started learning this. And this for me was one of those instances where uh, I was intimidated by something, but decided to get over that fear uh, by being determined to get good at it or thoroughly understand it in this case. And so what happened with me is that I started studying the finances and the corporate research in depth. And tonight I would like to share some of the biggest takeaways that I think are um, good places to start if you would like to get into some of this in, into some of this research. So um, I studied all the financial stuff that I could. Uh, this includes documents like the income statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow statements, and of course stocks and stuff like that. And I mean at one point I was studying this stuff line by line. And <clears throat> the place where you can find these documents, folks, because this is all public information, the place that you can find these documents is the investor relations section or the investor relations website of whatever company you're searching for. So if you're looking for UPS, if you're looking um, for Amazon, if you're looking for Starbucks, if you're looking for Ford, whoever whoever it is, whatever corporation is it is that you're trying to research, um, you go to their investor relations website, and that's where they have all this information. Uh, they have financial information, business information, basically information for the investors to study uh, the corporation and for potential investors to study the corporation. <clears throat> so there's a wealth of information in any investor relations website uh, for a company. Uh, the only thing is, you know, the company isn't counting on us, on the workers, to go through this information and look at it with a critical eye. You know, they're just trying to inform uh, shareholders and potential shareholders. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, this is where I'm coming in today. Um, I would like to help folks navigate this stuff. So, as I've already mentioned, uh, the first step is to, for instance, Google a company. Let's, let's say UPS. Let's, let's stick on that example. You can go online. You can Google UPS Investor Relations. And one of the first links that will pop up is their investor relations page. From there, um, and this is true practically of any investor relations page for any company, from there, they typically have a link that says financials. Um, and as the name suggests, you know, that's where you can find a lot of their financial information, including the stuff that I just mentioned. Um, so in the financial section of the investor relations page, you'll find, for instance, um, the income statement. <clears throat> now, there's two big things that you can take away from any income statement, uh, two lines that you want to look at. The first line 
is total revenues. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, this line is important because it speaks to the amount in sales a company made. And this is the number that's usually used by the media to describe the size of a company. So when you hear a company, uh, when you hear the media talk about how XYZ Corporation is a $50 billion a year corporation, they're usually talking about total revenues. And again, that's a line item. That's a number, a figure that you can find on the income statement in the financial section of the investor relations website of any company. Now, I keep stressing that, <clears throat> excuse me, I keep stressing that, you know, you're looking in the investor relations website because you're going directly to the company. This is a, this is a company website and it's important to get information directly from the company or directly from the government agency because it gives you credibility. You know, this way your information can't be dismissed because it was taken from some biased source like Fox or the New York Times or anything. No, you're getting it directly from the horse's mouth. So when you're going into the investor relations website and going through the financial documents and other documents I'm about to talk about, keep in mind that the value of this is that you're getting it directly from the company, not some biased journalist, not some biased news source, not some, you know, wonky. Um, <clears throat> source of information on YouTube, not some conspiracy theory. You know, you're getting it directly from the horse's mouth, and that's and that's what's important about this. Also, in the investor relations section of a company's website, uh, you will find the annual report and the 10K form, uh, the 10K reports. Now, these two are really massive documents that contain a great deal of narrative and a great deal of information. The, the 10K report itself uh, is a report that the company has to submit to the Security and Exchange Commission. This is a government, government agency that houses this type of information for corporations. And every year, corporations have to report on their finances. And in this 10K report, uh, they also report uh, on stuff like their facilities, so where their facilities are located. So if you go into the company's 10K report, you can see a list of all, all the facilities. And that's handy if, for instance, you're organizing at Starbucks and you want to know what all the facilities are in your surrounding area or in your state or something like that. Or if you're working for Amazon, same deal. If you want to know the facilities, <clears throat> that's a good place to look. Uh, more information that's useful on the um, 10K report is environmental information. You know, if the company has encountered any kind of environmental violations or anything like that, oftentimes it's on there. Uh, lawsuits that could affect the price of the stock are on there. Um, more financial information, um, executive compensation. But here's the thing. Um, the 10K report and the annual report are really big documents. So my advice is don't treat these like books, you know, don't like print them out and like curl up with a good cup of coffee and, you know, try to read it cover to cover. You need to go into these documents with some degree of some idea of what you're looking for. So my recommendation is to open up these documents and do uh, the control F or the find function with your computer on these documents. So you're going to look for some key words on there. So some key words that I would recommend right off the bat are words like labor and stoppage, environment, strike, boycott, legal, illegal, lawsuit, negative, media, environment, contamination, supply, debt, uh, the names of countries or locations, uh, casualties, deaths, injuries, negotiate, um, tariffs, resources, political, words like that. You know, go ahead and do a control find. Um, in the 10K report, just to see what gen what that generates. Uh, it, may, it may take you somewhere and it may give you a bit of information that you could use as leverage against the company. Now, similar to the 10K report is the annual report that the company puts out. Now, this is not a report that they submit to the government. Uh, this is a report that they publish for their shareholders or for potential shareholders so they can know where the company is at. 
So the company has more control of what goes on in the annual report. You know, it's it's glossier, more of a PR piece, a public relations piece. You know, they just tell you what they want to tell you. They have more control. And, you know, they do that. Um, or when they do that, you know, oftentimes they make things a little sexier for their shareholders just to let them know that things are OK. And that's where we come in. You know, that's the sort of things that we want to find in the annual report and in the 10K report is anytime they're bragging, anytime they're bragging about um, the earnings, the profits that the company made in the last year, we want to go ahead, copy and paste those things and use that in our literature, use that in our posters, use that uh, on our picket signs. Uh, talk about how they're bragging while workers aren't being paid a living wage. Talk about how they're bragging while workers don't have health care, or how they're bragging while workers are on strike and they cut the health care for the workforce. So those are the types of things that we want to look for in the annual report and uh, the 10K report. Again, there are a wealth of information, so don't treat it like a book. Go in there with some intent, um, and also, you know, feel free to communicate with us. I'm happy to talk about research with anyone who communicates with We Rise Fighting. Our email is wearisefighting at gmail.com. Uh, feel free to hit us up with any questions. More documents or another document on uh, the investor relations page is the proxy statement. Now, the proxy statement is really handy uh, because it contains executive compensation, um, so the salaries of CEOs, and you can actually do a control F on the proxy statement and just type in executive compensation and, and it will take you to that section. Again, this is another document that gets submitted to the Security and Exchange Commission, so there are certain requirements and certain reliable information in there that you can just count on being there. Executive compensation is always in there. Um, and it's always the same wording of executive compensation, that CEO salaries. And once you get to that section, it'll show you both the CEO salaries and things like how many shares they own and what kind of shares. And when you find out how many shares a CEO owns, you could also find out how much a share is worth and just crunch the numbers on that. You know, multiply the number of shares owned by a CEO by their value, and you get a real idea of how much they're bringing in. The proxy statement also contains uh, the location, date, and time of the annual shareholders meeting, um, which I should know anyone can attend as long as you own one share in the company. So that's a good place that if you want to come in and crash the party or you know dis disrupt things at an annual shareholder meeting, that's where you would get the information on the time, the location. So the proxy statement is good for those two things, uh, CEO compensation and the time location of their annual uh, shareholders meeting. <clears throat> now, finally, uh, for the sake of keeping it brief on this podcast, the last bit of information that I would like to put out there as far as, hey, this is out there, is relating to political contributions. Um, so this is where you can start to follow the money, you know, see who these corporate PAC, um, who, who these corporate PACs are funding. Uh, corporations have to donate uh, political contributions through PACs, political action committees. Um, and when you start to look at this information, you'll see that it can be examined at three levels. Uh, the federal level, um, you can find information on political contributions for the president and members of Congress. At the state level, um, you can find information on the government governor and state legislature. And at the local level, you can find information on the mayor and city council. Now, where do you go, though? Uh, if you want information for the federal level, you go to the Federal Election Commission website. Um, if you want information at the state level, again, for the governor or state legislature, uh, you go to the Secretary of State website. And if you want information on the mayor or city town council, uh, you go to the clerk and recorder's website. And regardless of what level of government or what website you're looking at, 
uh, you're trying to find information relating to campaign finance data. That's usually how it's talked about in these three websites at any level of um, research. So campaign finance data. Uh, from there, um, I'm going to put it in you, the hands of the listeners, to navigate a little bit because it's a little tricky to uh, help you navigate the websites from this podcast. So I'm just trying to give folks a little bit of general direction in this. And I should also mention <clears throat> the benefit to um, researching uh, the political contributions of CEOs or the political contributions of, you know, any uh, political ac action committee or anything like that, a requirement when you report on your contribution is that you also include your home address um, in the report. So you'll find the home addresses of CEOs and corporate managers in these um, political campaign reports. Uh, so that's an added perk, you know, and I'm just putting that out there in case you just want to send a thank you card to some of your favorite CEOs for doing the wonderful work that they do. So again, folks, I think that by virtue of this uh, podcast, I'm seeing that maybe I could also do a little video and post that on our Facebook page or on YouTube where folks can dig a little deeper into each one of these areas of research and other areas of research. But I just wanted to get folks a little acquainted, at least tell y'all about the investor relations website for any company so you can start digging through there uh, for some of the stuff that I've talked about on here and much more, you know, whatever it's relevant to you. Um, but <clears throat> this is public information. Again, this is intended for the benefit of shareholders and potential shareholders. It's not meant to be in the hands of workers, much less uh, workers who think critically. But this is information directly from them. I have to highlight that again. This is information directly from them. So it's not like a biased news source. So I'm going to encourage folks, you know, go ahead and check this information out. If you need help going through this information, if you, uh, you know, if you even want to talk about going through this information, uh, that's what I'm here for. That's what we're here for. But uh, we at least wanted to get you started on getting this information because that's part of what goes into preparing for successful strikes is things like knowing your enemy, you know, knowing the political forces that back your enemy knowing where the company is located, all the different facilities, you know, uh, knowing how much they're claiming in profits while the workers are living paycheck to paycheck, if that working 80 hours a week. Uh, so there's information that we can use as part of our shop floor tactics. And there's information that we can use as part of agitational prop propaganda or agitprop or information that we use to educate, agitate, and organize the rank and file. You know, it's all out there. Again, it's all out there. They just don't expect us, the working class, to look at it and think of it critically and try to find the jugglers in production and try to find the contradictions and what they're saying in their annual report and what they're putting in our paychecks. So that's the section on recent researching corporations. Honestly, I'm kind of juiced about this, so I don't think uh, I don't think this is going to be the end of it. I think I do have to get on some videos and just you know walk folks through the process. But I figured this would be a good place to start, and I know y'all can start doing some stuff like like that. So now I'm going to move on. Uh, Brian's got some information for us as far as the actual nuts and bolts of organizing and strike prep. Um, and yeah, I felt like these two go hand in hand, but now I'm gonna hand it over to Brian so you can take over from there. All right, thanks brother Rick for your tremendous contributions, uh, preparing for a strike. And uh, those of us who have been involved in strikes, either participant in strike or um, assisting a strike as a community supporter uh, or in other capacities know that there, once we go out on strike, we are up against a lot. So this, uh, some of these items we'll be talking about tonight and we're sharing, is just the beginning. Um, and as Rick mentioned many times, these should be done as part of a democratic discussion with fellow union members and uh, you know, having conversations with our loved ones who we live with in our community, because going out on strike is, is, a, is a, a big, big sacrifice. 
and it's not, not to be taken lightly. And I think um, those of us here would advocate. Well, obviously, we're in support of strikes, but we're not in, uh, you know, in support of workers being out there and just being left out to dry. We want to make sure when we go out on strike that we're strong, that we have as much as we can prepared and ready to move, and uh, and we can actually be successful in what we want to do. Is of course win a better contract and uh, better conditions and improve our community. So the preparation is very important because we can assess these things. We can say, are we ready uh, to go on strike? And if we're not, uh, then maybe we can engage in some other actions inside the work site where we're at to lead up to a place where we can get our strength. And those tactics are many. Uh, they can involve all kinds of different uh, things. And uh, we definitely suggest those if we're not ready for a strike. But if we are, uh, we move forward. And as Rick said, uh, having proper preparation and research is the first step. And then doing a survey because we want to know what our members care about and how we're actually, you know, going out on something that the, the members are actually ready to fight for. Not just a couple staff people or an organizer that might think they know what the issues are. Uh, and that's great. But what do the members actually care for and what are they going to fight for and stay out and strike and sacrifice their, their money and resources and their family time uh, to do? So we want to make sure that we have absolutely accurate information on that. And there's a, there's a variety of different kinds of strikes. There's political strikes, there's economic strikes, and uh, there's a variety of um, great uh, historians who have written on this from Jeremy Brecker's strike to Philip Foner's work, a uh, series of work on strikes and a variety of others uh, that have written on this. Uh, Labor's giant step from the CIO uh, strikes in the 30s and many other great uh, resources that we would strongly suggest to check out. But here today, we're going to talk about uh, what we call the first contract campaign. And uh, Dr. Kate Bronfenbrenner uh, from Cornell University has done a lot of studies on this, that uh, it's one thing to win a vote. So if we win a vote, for example, let's say we're in the private sector and we win a National Labor Relations Board election or we're in the public sector and we win a campaign. Dr. Bronfenbrenner have proved, has proved that the more successful uh, uh, strikes are more successful when more, more tactics are used. And this might seem intuitive, but she actually did, a, did many studies on this. And if we use, you know, one or two tactics or three and do them sporadically, the odds of winning a strike are going to be very minimal. If we're using five, six, seven, eight, nine tactics or even 10 consistently in creative ways and having fun with that too, it's important to have, you know, cultural events and fun as well. And we mix this up. Uh, moving towards what we want, it's going to be much more successful. So, of course, you know, when we're doing a first contract campaign, the thing is to win a first contract. Uh, and Dr. Bronfenbrenner has also proved that half of the, the elections that are won in this country, half of them do not get to a first contract. And that's the goal. So when we're going out there and talking to workers and knocking on doors and meeting workers at the work site to win the, the, the vote for uh, union recognition, we win the vote, uh, excuse me, not union recognition, but we win the vote, uh, we need to win a contract to win union recognition. So we need to have that in mind from the beginning of the, any campaign that we do, just like we need to have in mind uh, community aspects of our campaign in mind from the beginning of all of our campaigns, not just when we're in trouble as a union. So I just wanna emphasize that as well as the membership surveys are critical, as we mentioned, and also, hopefully, the bargaining team that we would uh, elect is an elected team, not an appointed team. Uh, and it's also representative of the work site. Because the, the last situation that we want to get in is we have 20 different departments in a work site and only two of them are represented at the bargaining table. Right. We don't want to end up there. We want to make sure that not only diversity in terms of uh, having workers of color and women and LGBTQ workers on the bargaining team, we also need to make sure that our work site is represented. So if an employer, uh, for example, owns a manufacturing plant, but the workers in the warehouses in the city are members of the union as well, or the maintenance department, we need to know where these workers are and they need to be on the bargaining team. So we have all the issues that we're talking about in the bargaining team. So we so the boss can't pit us against each other and we're all on you know the same page. So we should think about our tactics and 
one of the things that we need to do from the beginning is make sure that we have things centralized as much as we can. So creating committees, for, for example, a solidarity committee uh, or a uh, the organizing committee from the first campaign can roll over into the first contract campaign. And many of those people might want to stay on the organizing committee. If they don't, their, their knowledge of the beginning work and that should be, again, diverse. And the tactics should be something that uh, you know, somebody can do such as sending a, a, an email to different kinds of things that folks can do uh, during the first contract campaign, including up to and including a strike. So we're, we're, what we're doing when we're doing all this work is that we're looking for if we're actually ready to move when a strike comes and the members are building their confidence and their, the more tactics that they do and the more escalated tactics that they do, the more strength they get, the more unity that we develop between the workers and among the workers and our community supporters. And then if the employer refuses to bargain uh, or refuses to uh, give us a first contract that is actually amenable to our demands, we, uh, let's say, are going to go on strike. And whether it's a private or a public sector, these general guidelines are true. And there's different laws, and we want to emphasize that, that there are different uh, laws that we have to uh, be aware of. Uh, but as, I, as we said before, uh, if the laws are immoral, uh, there needs to be discussion within the union whether they need to be defied or not, and that's a membership decision. So we would strongly suggest part of building the solidarity and unity that we need, it also needs to be fun. We need to have culture. We need to have people bonding with each other. So leading up to the first day of bargaining, having things like art builds or community cookouts or picnics, uh, and using that as an opportunity to consolidate our contacts, to have a press conference and use that as an organizing opportunity. Uh, bring in uh, food, music, kids games, and then you know having a petition there or whatever the uh, demand is, uh, put them on petitions, circulate the petition, set up tables and getting people prepared. Uh, or if the strike is already on, using that and moving that forward. We also need to have a clear and concise calendar. What is going on? The bargaining team reporting back to uh, the the membership consistently should be strike bulletins. What's the communication infrastructure that we have today? We have a lot of different technology, but some workers use that, some don't. So we need to make sure that everybody is is talked to, and uh, how are we going to reach them? And uh, the organizing committee that was essential to winning the union vote uh, is essential here too, where it can help with this phase of the campaign, uh, the first contract and a strike if the employer refuses to bargain. So if we're on strike and we go on strike, the first day is absolutely essential. We cannot go out meek and mild. We need to be strong, we need to be bold. And that employer needs to understand across that table that we will escalate our tactics if they continue to refuse to meet our demands. And that includes all kinds of things such as sticker and button days. Uh, we can do all kinds of things in the community. A lot of students, of course, uh, and youth and families, the kids of the uh, strikers, uh, they can do things at schools, they can do walkouts, they can get into the neighborhoods. Uh, but that first day on strike is absolutely essential. Again, we can use that for an organizing opportunity, have demands uh, on the banners, uh, color t-shirts, and uh, you know we should tell on the mic, anyone that speaks on the mic before the media, that they're backed up and, with labor and surrounded by community supporters. Uh, there's, there's usually nothing worse when there's one person at the podium, and that's what the people in the media are seeing. We got, you know, so we might have uh, 500 people at the opening day of the strike at a press conference, but that media and our social media is going to go out to a lot of different people. So we need to show the depth and the breadth of the work that we have been doing in our community at that first day on strike, that we are not playing here and we're going to fight until we get what we deserve and use this opportunity uh, to get out the information, have the union literature, have uh, stickers, have uh, a strike bulletin, have the demands. And again, as Rick mentioned, the UPS 1997 strike, one of the reasons it was so successful, uh, everywhere you went, you could hear the slogan that we don't want to work part-time lives. So we demand full-time jobs with union pay so we can actually uh, feed and care for our loved ones and have time to spend with our families and our loved ones in our community. And that message was backed up again and again, east, west, north, and south, all over the country. And that's what we need. Uh, consistent messaging is absolutely essential. So no matter where the media goes, no matter where the community goes, they see a placard, they see a banner, 
they know that what this strike is about and they're ready to fight for it. So uh, again, just emphasizing during the first contract campaign, the goal is to get a contract and we need to get that contract for union recognition. We can always build upon it, but we, but it's very essential to get that first contract and all of these components and many, many more. Uh, these are just some guidelines and suggestions uh, for, for uh, a first contract campaign. Now, if we already have a pre-existing union that has a contract and we are going into another bargaining session to get another contract, a consecutive contract, as Rick said again, the minute we sign a contract, we should be bargaining, we should be organizing for the next contract and thinking that we're going to have to go on strike. We, we should never go on strike if we get mad at the bargaining table one day and then everybody says, well, let's go on strike and we have nothing prepared. We're going we're gonna to get uh, beat bad uh, most of the time. So if the employer refuses the demands of the bargaining team and the membership goes on strike in a contract campaign uh, where we've already had a, a pre-existing contract, uh, these are some of the um, suggestions for that. So we just had a successful example at the Teamsters at Cisco in Plimpton, Massachusetts. We suggest our listeners reach out and check that out. Um, so from the first day of the bargaining a new contract, the membership must strike as one. So when we go out on strike, we are striking as one, whether we have disagreements or not. Uh, if we all agreed to strike, we're striking as one and we're going out as one union with our, with our fellow workers and we're not playing and we're going to fight until we get our contract. And as Rick said, again, the proper advanced preparation is essential. The day we're going out on strike, we should have been organizing and that's the goal, right? We need our black, our, our messages on our placards and our banners. Uh, we should we should not organize a strike on the fly. The organizing committee is again is essential. Uh, we should have a solidarity committee in place that can run this and centralize this because you know let's say we have even if it's 25 or 50 or 100 workers, we have to run a strike 24/7. Uh, whether you know we only run it from 7 a.m. in the morning to 6 o'clock at night, we still need to do prep at night. We need to build all of this into our calendar as we mentioned. A lot of the things that apply to any strike apply to this. So again, you know, applying art builds and rallies and having union events at the hall and political education at the hall and on the picket line. And uh, we should always be including our community partners and our faith-based partners who are pro-union and supportive of us and anybody who's supportive of us to win our contract. So consistency is key on a strike. So for example, you know, of course we know that in bargaining, there's many different things that we want to win in a contract. But again, we want to stick with the major demands that really resonate with both the union and the community, and we fight for that. And again, we can study the Teamster strike and the, uh, the mine worker strike against Pittston in 89 and 90 was another example where everybody knew that they were fighting for their uh, retirement benefits. One day, the company just cut off their retirement benefits, and many families in Southwest Virginia at that time were relying on those benefits, and uh, that resonated with the community. So. Once the membership decides on all of this, the demands and they're, they're you know, they're out there, uh, you know, you're on strike, keeping consistent with the message and making sure that we have all of these supplies at the union hall, right? We need to make sure that anytime any striker goes to the picket, picket uh, line, that they have what they need. So the union hall needs to be outfitted with the, the correct banners, the placards, the one day strike bulletins and all the information. We have a lot of social media today. So aspects of that can be used as well, but being consistent on our messaging and no matter what we use is very important. The other thing is that in today's day and age, uh, you know, we never forget uh, that we should always keep our, just in case, we should always have backup systems in place in multiple places and spaces in case the union's equipment isn't working or in case other people attack the union hall that are not friendly to the union, in case, you know, laptops are stolen or anything like that happens. We need to make sure that we have various different places that we can fight from. Also, picket line assignments and locations need to be decided. So while on strike, union members and community supporters need to keep an updated presence. So for example, the strikers are subject to injunctions, but we can have people's, uh, people's pickets where most of the time the faith and community faith-based people uh, are not subject to injunctions. So they might be able to do some very creative things in support of the union. Picket captains need to be chosen. Centralized methods by the org organizing committee to make sure that we have accurate information and that's ongoing. Uh, new technology is good, but using 
you know, standby stuff like walkie talkies are still effective. Flying squadrons where we have leaders on standby, strike leaders on standby where they can go to a picket line. And while we're on picket line, we need to be disciplined uh, and not get goaded into, uh, you know, by the, either by the capitalist media or goaded by uh, scabs uh, or by the cops and really be on point and be disciplined to defend our members and our uh, to win our contract at all times. And we would say also that food and beverages should always be available at strike headquarters. Uh, it takes a lot to be on strike, four, six, eight hours a day, whatever our workers out there in the hot sun and the cold weather. We should always have our sergeant at arms and our community supporters, uh, making sure our union hall is safe for anybody that goes there. And no bullshit should be tolerated at the union hall. We try to keep, uh, you know, the use of alcohol or other drugs out of the union hall, if at all possible. Um, that can cause a lot of things that we don't need. And it also can be used to frame up our leaders. And we use centralized methods uh, and report to who we need to report to. Or essentially, when we're on strike, we're in military formation. Uh, daily strike bulletins, as we mentioned, delivering leaflets on the picket line. That's where we can have, we can ask unemployed workers and students. That was used in 1934 Minneapolis Teamster strike. The unemployed workers distributed things on the picket line. Weather should be taken into consideration. So we should have, uh, right now, the UAW Local 180s on strike in Racine, Wisconsin, for example. So having hand warmers and hot beverages and firewood and winter gear and all that stuff needs to be at the union hall and at the ready or at different locations uh, in the city that the strike is in. So people can have that all the time when you're out there in 20 below weather. We need to keep up the, the morale of the strikers. And that happens by having food and hot beverages out there and making sure we have firewood for them and barrels and things like that, whatever they need. And uh, also these picket lines can be used as a class struggle school. So the organizing committee, while the workers are on strike, could have reading sessions, videos on labor history. With social media today, we could have solidarity messages out there on the picket line using flatbed trucks. We could go into the community and uh, do all kinds of things across the state that we're having to strike in. We could do solidarity rallies, have car caravans to the picket line. Uh, like during the Black Lives Matter protest in 2020, there was a lot of very creative car caravans that we could adopt uh, and learn from our Black Lives Matter. Uh, friends to bring it to the union hall, bring it to the strike. A lot of those, uh, the majority of the Black Lives Matter uh, members or participants are also workers as well, and they have a lot of experience. So we can do that from a lot of other places in the community. And uh, many unions who go on strike today are part of a, uh, of a national union. So for example, the UAW has graduate school workers, right? That they might have off during the break. They could come in to help, reinforcements. They could do video messages, all kinds of things. Um, we could also have, uh, you know, making sure that uh, our committees in place, such as medical safety committees and those types of things could be employed as necessary. Uh, we should also be uh, making sure that we have postings in the union hall so people can know where to go for whatever they might need. Uh, I would say the last couple of things that could be used are community solidarity brigades. And this, of course, depends on the community. But uh, being out there with leaflets and caravans, sound systems, uh, going to uh, biz local businesses with placards, say, I support the union on strike, um, and all kinds of other creative actions. We workers are very smart folks. We know what to do. And during a strike, uh, we need to tap into the experience of workers, not just on strike, but also in the community. And there's a lot of different creative actions that could be employed that we're not even thinking of right here. So we should really tap into that, too. Uh, but ultimately, workers and their unions should never forget that corporations have the entire might of the capitalist state on their side. And this includes the police, the courts, and the capitalist media. We need to rely the workers. Our ultimate strength is with us, workers, the community, and internationally with working people. And that's what wins strikes. The research, the preparation is very important, and everything we just mentioned is all very, very critical. But we have to rely on ourselves. Uh, at our strength. Anything else, we might get a politician that's friendly to unions. That might be a bonus. That's nice uh, if they're friendly to labor, but uh, they're not going to win the strike for us. We are going to win our own strikes in solidarity with our fellow workers and our community supporters, and that's what we need to rely on. And the last thing I'll add is just that political strikes are a bit of a different character. Uh, when a pub, more so, it's, it's always a political and economic strike, but especially public sector workers. Uh, when you're going on strike, you are going up against the municipality or state. 
uh, and that needs to be taken into account because there's various laws, such as in New York State and others, not that we're afraid to defy those laws, but there are very onerous provisions in there where unions can be fined or people can be put in jail and not to say that we're not willing to be uh, you know, arrested or whatever for our union or strike, but those things should be discussed democratically within the union and the community uh, to how to move forward with that. Uh, so a uh, political economic strike, for example, would be what happened in Wisconsin in uh, 2011 uh, during the state capital occupation against the Jim Crow Act 10, which essentially eliminated collective bargaining rights for public sector workers. So that's that's a lot of stuff we know. Uh, but like Rick said, we're more than willing to discuss more of this. This is just a very short guideline uh, for how to win strikes. And we believe Dr. Bren from Brenner's work is very instrumental to this. And as we said, Philip Boner's work on strikes, studying our labor history, uh, such as the 1877 uh, railroad strike and many others, the Minneapolis Teamsters strike, the 1934 uh, uh, dock worker strike in uh, San Francisco and a general strike there. And there's many others uh, that can be studied and very, very important lessons from them that can the, be adopted today to the current period. The IWW strike, Lawrence, Massachusetts. Yes. There were like 50 languages spoken in that strike. Yes. And the IWW got it together, you know, uh, like, like you mentioned before, you know, like diversity in a union, man, that, that, that should be embraced. That should, you know, you can form caucuses. You know, you can form different committees and this is power. You know, this is this isn't a weakness for the union. I mean, each time you do that, you're tapping into the power of that workers community. So community and uh, committees, caucuses, stuff like that. Consider stuff having stuff like that to give workers a voice, give workers a voice in, in the union. Because like we, we've been saying, we don't know what direction some of this stuff will go in. You know, I mean, look at the stuff in Wisconsin and, you know, you get excited about workers getting political power and stuff like that. Well, what are you going to do once you get there? You know, you have to have some stuff in place. You have to understand the political landscape and you have to have some principles in place. How are you going to navigate a new world? How are you going to navigate, you know, the seizure of power? How are you going to navigate uh, a strike wave or a general strike? You know, uh, how are you going to keep it organized, uh, fighting and effective? So I don't think this will be the last time that we talk about this, either as a full episode or um, as part of an episode. You know, this is something that's, uh, really important right now, and we would like to contribute to this discussion because there is a lot of labor activity happening right now, and a lot of stuff that's that's very exciting. So uh, we would like to contrib continue contributing to this particular discussion. Yes, there's a lot you know that that can be learned from you know playing back. You know this uh, part. This one thing about podcasts, you can just play them over and over again, and. Uh, Maybe just pick out one or two or three or four items from what uh, Brian and Rick said, and just keep them in your mind, you know, so that so that if you're faced with that, or you know, you're going to go on strike, but also if you're more likely is if you're going to be supporting a strike, you know, take take the lead of the workers, you know, the guidance of the workers. Uh, so there's a lot there's a lot to be learned here. So. Uh, and hopefully there'll be a lot of strikes going on in the future and that, you know, our class will get stronger and, and support each other because, you know, we have the power in our hands if we can just reach out and organize with it. So we, uh, thanks, guys. It's been great. Yeah, we, we do have the, the power, you know, just as Brother Clarence Thomas pointed out and we talked about in the last episode, <clears throat> you know, right now there's a possibility of uh, worker action on the docks on the on the west coast uh railway worker action all along the railways uh the possibility of a ups strike like a lot of things can come together and as brother clarence thomas said you know part of it is us talking to each other workers communicating with each other so that railway worker communicating with the ups worker communicating with the longshore worker i mean can you imagine where where that could take us and what kind of leverage that would be for the working class today. Uh, but in order to pull stuff like that off, yeah, we need to research each other. We need to understand what's going on. We need to have some principles, uh, some some tactics, um, and yeah, polish off our labor history. Like, see what has worked in the past. You know, we keep referencing the 1997 uh, Teamster strike. 
that was a very successful strike, and there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that. So we encourage you, our listeners, to also delve deeper into you know what lessons you can gain from that strike. Uh, we will leave it at this for tonight. Uh, we thank you, the listeners, for being here with us always. Uh, we wish you nothing but love and solidarity out there. Um, and continue listening to We Rise Fighting. We will have more information on on leading strikes and also how to research information for strikes. Uh, go ahead, check out our web, uh, our Facebook page, and we will catch you again soon, ho- uh, hopefully. So take care, folks. We will talk to you soon. Bye bye. No, I didn't get fired, but I almost did because I wasn't. I was turning at a forty-five degree angle away from the flag. Yeah. The flags the, Whoa. At a basketball game. Oh, snap. But uh, I'm I'm not supposed to represent my. Uh, so bagging groceries on base oh, with just no, tips, no salary, yeah, wouldn't even yeah, make yeah, enough in one well, day to buy a CD. Oh, yeah. So next thing you know, mom's is picking me up from jail for stealing CDs at Blockbuster. <laughs> Back in the days when I was a teenager Minimum wage earning, rocking an apron I was pushing hella cards, asking plastic and paper To bastard ass customers, plus most of us had Relatives working in the same supermarket When boss wasn't looking, rolled the dice on the carpet In the lunchroom, listening to Biggie and Nas But not as much as Snoop, 40, Water and Pac me, I rock the Walkman instead, writing rhymes in my head, often bored, I'd recite them out loud, and memorize a song long before I write it down, in lunchroom freestyles is where I learned to clown, plantation style, yellow, brown, black, majority, half the young cats either enlisted in the army or the navy or marines, but I was having dreams, and I ain't even halfway there yet, it seems that we never get paid what our labor is worth, it's why we often in a daze on the way to our work, and when we get there, we can't wait to be out, so let me tell you what it's about, and now we never get paid what our labor is worth It's why we often in a daze on the way to our work And when we get there, we can't wait to be out So let me tell you what it's about So you do telemarketing, right? 7 a.m. shifts on the West Coast means we're calling the East Coast And on 9-11, this fool tries to fire me for refusing to make calls during the air The next place of employment's no better than this My first day thinking this some fucking office space shit But not me, boss These conditions ain't suitable High dependent pad right Writing rhymes in a cubicle, automated phone click, dial tone, cold calling, hoping for some gullible folks to take the offer, a mission for commission, tuition for college, please put our number on your do not call list, half the whole staff graduated with honors, and you're trying to tell me telemarketing's your best job option, this shit is not popping, working to the bone, living at home, facing up debt and student loans, now the manager's a tool and a clown, but productivity increases anytime he's nowhere to be found, and this tight ass environment makes me want to earl, like watching Flavor flavor tongue kissing old girl Now we never get paid what our labor is worth That's why we often in a daze on the way to our work And when we get there, we can't wait to be out So let me tell you what it's about And now we never get paid what our labor is worth That's why we often in a daze on the way to our work And when we get there, we can't wait to be out So let me tell you what it's about no, so like every job I've ever had There's always been some kind of side hustle Whether it's sneaking into working games, at the paper I was either slanging media guides Or slanging them CDs And uh, you know, just get above that minimum wage The dot com phenomenon Fuck the city raw Stock market falls down Hundred thousands laid off Got with Amazon.com It had a lot of cross dresses Goth cats, ex-cons And single moms on the elevator up My Walkman on Flash a badge for security The mark of the beast But with skills to persuade through speech you be amazed to see how many customer service reps are MCs. At each instance, different job descriptions. What kept the brother going was the music that I listened to. Initiate the day with an anthem to work through. Then the supervisor started blasting Dave Matthews. Shit is bad news. Working for some assholes in suits, straight singing middle management blues. And so I quit on the last day of training. And when I got home, my notebook was waiting. I said we never get paid what our labor is worth. That's why we often in a day's on the way to our work. And when we get there, we can't wait to be out So let me tell you what it's about And now we never get paid what our labor is worth That's why we often in a daze on the way to our work And when we get there, we can't wait to be out I told you what this shit is about